Welcome back to another episode of Consciously Clueless. You're here because you want to learn about how to live a healthier life, how to live more sustainably, how to take your everyday actions and make them work for you and the planet. Sometimes it might feel like you've got this figured out and other times you probably feel lost. That's why I'm here. Together, we will learn how to live happier, healthier lives without the need to be perfect and always allowing space for a little cluelessness on this journey to living a more conscious life. This episode with John Rush, the professional Canadian football player, originally aired December of 2020. In it, we talk about the reality of breeding animals and why you should adopt and not shop for your pets. Here we go. Are you ready to hear some good news stories? Dive into the Healthy Seas podcast and meet the people doing all they can to help the seas and oceans thrive from above and below the waves. Host Crystal DiMicelli talks to diverse fishers, experts, and more about what they're doing to protect our source of life and how you and I can help from wherever we are. Healthy Seas is a marine conservation organization whose mission is to tackle the ghost fishing phenomenon and turn this waste into an opportunity for a more circular economy. They do this through cleanups, prevention, education, working with partners who recycle and repurpose this material. This new show highlights their work and the work of their peers around the world. Go to forcesfornature.com slash healthy seas podcast to listen. I have a very special episode for you today. This will come out a few days before December 5th, which is annual Celebrate Shelter Pets Day. And I knew just who I wanted to talk to for this. John Rush is back. John is a professional Canadian football player, a vegan, an advocate for ending violence against women, and a lover of shelter dogs. We talk about breeding, shelter pets, and why you should adopt and not shop. Enjoy the episode. Well, thank you for joining me again. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I thought that it would be fun. Um, I had to look back and see what the day was actually called, but we're recording this in honor of uh, December 5th, which is apparently Celebrate Shelter Pets Day. There you go. And I wanted to um, talk specifically about that on the podcast soon, and I was like, who better to talk to <laughs> than John yeah, that's about fair. celebrating shelter pets? So yeah. give us a... If, People haven't listened to the very first episode, which shout out to you for being brave enough to be my first episode again. Um, yeah, there you go. Give us a little recap of your shelter pets that you have right now. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, I've been adopting dogs since I was nine years old. Um, I somehow convinced my parents when I was a nine year old to let me have a, a this crazy black lab from the Niagara Humane Society. Um, he, he was a great dog. He was wild, an absolute <laughs> wild dog. Just, uh, but he was great. He was he was so much fun. And then we had him for fourteen years. Um, and then when I went to college, he 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 uh, passed away. But um, fourteen years is a long time for a bigger dog, too. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a it was it was crazy how long we had him. It, wow. It was like I think it surprised kind of all of us, which was which obviously was you know it was very good for us. We were happy with it. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it was a very long time for a, a big dog. But um, now, right now, I have two dogs, Bone and Bailey. Bone's a uh, 150 pound. Uh, <laughs> most most people think he's a polar bear, but he's a great Pyrenees Saint Bernard mix. And Bailey, uh, I was fostering her uh, at the start of the year, and like the first day I fostered her, I'm just like, yeah, I'm gonna adopt this. Like, <laughs> and like, she's still here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I knew I was gonna adopt her kind of from the start. So. Um, but yeah, she's she's about a hundred pounds. She's about to turn one. Um, she's a great Pyrenees something mix. We're not really sure yet. We got bone DNA tested, so we know, but we oh, don't fun. know. Bailey is. So, did you have you fostered dogs before Bailey, or was that the first one? And then you were like, "Oh, this is going to be a problem." <laughs> no, no, I I did foster one dog before Bailey. I fostered Wolfie. Um, oh, okay, and, I do actually remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was kind of there for a couple months. Uh, he was a great dog. He was wild as well and like we we had to work with him he was uh so he came from like northern manitoba where um like he was just like a wild dog like he like had never been in a home he had never wow. like lived with people they found him on like living underneath a porch oh. uh they thought he was a coyote at first um so like yeah like he was just like when i got him he was i want to say like 
I can't remember exactly, but he was like four or five months. Okay. And he'd lived outside his entire life. So literally wild. Like yeah, not just like Yeah, like a legitimately wild dog. And so like there was like a lot of work we had to do with him that um like he was just crazy. Like <laughs> he was just crazy. You know, <laughs> it, it wasn't used to living in a in a home. But by the end of it, like I have pictures and videos, like like he loved it by the end. It was like the, like just like loved to cuddle, loved to like hang out on the couch, like he would like, he was like, he was kind of like a German shepherd, probably husky mix. So he had a lot okay. of energy. Mm-hmm. So he would like, he, he loved to wrestle, but like he also, he was a big chill too. So. Oh, yeah. so yeah. what about Bailey when you fostered her where you were like, oh shit, I'm going to keep this dog. <laughs> uh, she, the, the problem with Wolfie was yeah, he was going to be a smaller dog and like he loved to wrestle so much. Um, but with how big bone is, I always had that fear that like bone would just, throw him and he'd like break his leg or something like that yeah. you know what I mean and like that was always like a big concern of mine because like like Bowen's not aggressive in any way like like at all but like when they're playing around Bowen's so big that it's easy for him to just like jump up in the air and if he lands funny like there goes a leg or there you know there goes a Bone could break a leg of mine on accident <laughs> <laughs> like- exactly right so like so like I have to be like I have to be like really careful about especially when he's like around other people when he wants to play like I'm like hey like <laughs> like he can play but like you guys got to know like he's 150 pounds and like that's a lot of dog so yeah. so with Wolfie it, it was like it just didn't really make sense mm-hmm. for like kind of like our situation uh, but then when Bailey came around she I got I got her at like 16 weeks and she was already like. 60 pounds and I'm like oh this girl's a unit yeah like, <laughs> she's a big girl like and like and she like loved to wrestle too she was like she was about that like life where she would like come in hot and like just like no fear so uh so like, it just kind of worked out and she's like she's about to turn a year she's like 110 pounds like and she like when she plays with bone she like holds her own like mm-hmm. I'm not like ever worried about like a situation where uh like Bailey would get hurt because like I honestly I honestly worry more about bone because of how it like wild Bailey is than, girl uh, after my own heart <laughs> yeah exactly right so uh yeah but yeah so like that when I kind of met her I was just like oh yeah this girl like she's a unit I love it like yeah this girl's gonna this girl's gonna stay here so you had the foster dog growing up that you convinced your parents yeah. to get how did you get bone like what was like you were in school and so you were, didn't have a dog for a while right like you know going to college and stuff yeah so um it actually took me a long time um so it all all of university I didn't have a dog um like it just didn't make sense I had you know so much other stuff going on like um you know I, I think people that get dogs in college not the right move really and you're an athlete too so that's like a lot of time and exactly right so like there's there's so much stuff going on in in college and especially with the added athlete part on top of that it's just like it's not really a good time for a lot of people Mm -hmm. to be getting dogs or like animals Mm -hmm. um but yeah so like I waited till I was out and then I like played my first full year at the CFL and I'm like you know what like I'd really I really want a dog like you know I love dogs I'm like I'm established now I have you know money coming in I feel like I can take care of a dog again um so I actually looked for like eight months um oh wow bone. yeah like I was I was looking every day like I knew I wanted a big dog my first dog hunter was a black lab he was like he was like 90 to 100 pounds kind of hovered in there uh and my brother has a 130 pound rottweiler uh that I love <laughs> yeah that that like me me and Hugo like me and Hugo are best friends Hugo like, oh my god yeah. he loves me I love him it's, it's you know like we're the we're besties and I live with my brother for a while so I, I always knew I'm like, Hey, like if I'm getting a dog, I want a, a big dog so I can, um, that it can play with like Hugo. So, mm-hmm. like, I, like, I don't want like a small dog. Cause Hugo's like a, Hugo's a big Rottweiler. Right. So that um, Hugo would see as a snack. <laughs> well, exactly, right? So like I wanted a dog that they could like wrestle and play around with and, yeah. and do all that stuff. With. And that like, I could like wrestle with too. Like, you know, I like, I love playing with, I love playing with the dogs, especially in the snow. Like, um, so I was looking for like eight months and then it was like super, it honestly, how I got bone was super fluke. It was crazy. Uh, we were and on, hold on just a sec. Did you know that you wanted a, a shelter dog, right? Like you were like, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't going to do anything else. Yeah. Like okay. we, 
at that time, like we've all, like me and a couple of guys on the team, like volunteered at the Winnipeg Humane Society and did all that. Like there, yeah, there was no chance I was ever not going to get a, a okay. shelter dog. So, yeah. I figured just making sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it was super fluke actually. Like I, uh, we were on bye week. It was like week, I want to say like 17 of 18 on the season and we had a bye week. So I flew home to Niagara to see my parents. And I was looking on the website, it's called petfinder.com and it, it shows kind of like all the uh, shelter dogs in your area. Uh, it's a sweet re- website. It's, uh, that's where I found both my dogs actually. Um, and uh, so I was just like looking on there like while I was home to, to see like, because I, I'm 2000 kilometers away in Winnipeg, obviously the dogs are gonna be, you know, very different. So I was looking just like one morning and, and like Bone was the first dog to pop up. And, you know, it was like this, big white dog it was like great pyrenees i'm like man great pyrenees like i never even heard of great pyrenees before. yeah i'm like what the hell is this like so i looked at him and I'm like man like this dog looks crazy like but he looks big like i'm like i gotta go see this dog he's <laughs> a big like, boy <laughs> yeah like, i'm like I-, I gotta see this dog right you know what i mean like, i'm like i'm like here for a week so like so i mentioned him I'm like hey like you know i'm here for a week like can i come see this dog and they're like yeah for sure like one works and i'm like could be there in like 45 minutes right? <laughs> see you soon <laughs> yeah like they're like all right so i i whip up to it was like it was in hamilton so i whip up like 45 minutes away from my house and i meet this dog and i'm like oh yeah like i'm adopting this dog <laughs> like i told him straight up i'm like oh really like, oh yeah so like he just got there like literally that day and they're like well he's not neutered he needs to be neutered like he still needs to get all his vaccines and, and do all that stuff i'm like okay like that actually kind of works out perfect because I still had to go back to Winnipeg for a couple of weeks. Uh, like, cause we still had like the last regular season game in, and uh, some playoffs to finish, but I'm like, I'll be back in like three or four weeks. Can I pick him up then? They're like, yeah, it's perfect. He'll be like fully healed, fully ready mm-hmm. to go. I'm like, perfect. So like, yeah, like we finished up the season. I drove home and, and went and picked him up like right after that. And didn't, I think you shared this before. I I don't think I made this up. Wasn't he like really close to like getting Ixnade? Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. He was so, uh, like his story is, um, he's actually from a breeder originally. Uh, His first family got him from a breeder. um, And then at six months or six to seven months, he got too big. He was like, he was like a hundred pounds at six months. And um, they, they gave him up for adoption. And uh, he's from Quebec, and there's a lot of a lot of shelters in Quebec are still kill shelters. Um, mm. and they're not they're not as common in in uh, like Ontario or Manitoba. It's like very rare that you'll find that, but in Quebec they're still uh, relatively common. So he he was at a kill shelter, and he was there for like I think he was there for like two two or three months, and then like they're just like especially because how big he is, it's like he's not like a cheap dog to like house and and take care of you know what i mean like it's a lot of money for shelters to take care of them and most shelters are already on like very thin budgets yeah so the shelter was like called out so like he was like set to be euthanized that week and the the shelter like called out to like other shelters are like hey like this dog's like perfectly fine they're like we just can't afford to take care of him anymore oh my god so we're gonna like have to put him down kind of thing um if like if someone doesn't come pick him up. So the shelter I got him from drove nine hours to Quebec to pick him up, drove nine hours back. And then I just happened to see him literally the morning they got back from Quebec and then adopted him like from there. The universe was like, this is John's dog. Yeah, literally. Right. (laughs) So, so like, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Like he was like literally about to get uh, killed and like, like he's such a perfect dog. Like, yeah, I mean, you've seen all the pictures and videos Mm -hmm. of him. Like he's, he's a big chill, like doesn't, like he was perfectly trained, perfectly house trained. He doesn't have any accidents. Like he's chewed the odd thing, but like doesn't chew shoes. Like his favorite thing is like wooden spoons. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So like, I just, I learned to like put away wooden spoons. You know what I mean? That's like, like also right. kind of cute. Like I know, I know right? he shouldn't, but like, it's kind of cute. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like, but like, you know what I mean? Like he, he's such a great dog that I'm like, there's literally nothing wrong with this dog. Like it's, crazy how good he is and, and like how like he's well trained like knows how to sit give a paw like do all the tricks Aww. like I'm like man like I can't believe someone gave him up and like not to mention like Great Pyrenees St. Bernard's if you get them from a breeder like that's like five or six thousand dollars like they're not like cheap dogs 
Like I, I looked into it after because a couple of people told me they're like, they're like, oh, did you get him neutered? Like you should breed him. And I'm like, fuck no. Like, like <laughs> you're not, missing like, the point. <laughs> exactly. Like, like first of all, no. And like second of all, like, like why would I do that? And like people are like, oh man, like you can make so much money. Like Great Pyrenees is like, especially good looking ones like that, like go for so much money. So I looked into it and like they do. Like if you That's have a good wild. looking like, like people were telling me he could be like a show dog because of how good looking he is and that like I should breed him and make a bunch of money. I'm like, I'm like, so the family that had him before me, mm-hmm. like, I I don't know what they were thinking. Like, I don't know like what they were thinking when they, they bought him, like what was going on in their mind. Cause they, like, they definitely paid a lot of money for this dog and then gave him up after six months, like for no reason, for absolutely no reason. Cause he's too big. Right. Like, like that was their, like, but how did they not know he was going to get big? If you got him from a breeder, like, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like he's a great Pyrenees St. Bernard. Like, <laughs> they're literally called giant dog breeds, right? Like, it's not like you go into it's not buy, a secret. Yeah. It's not like you buy like a Ford F-150 and then you get it. You're like, oh, this is a truck. Oh, I wanted a fucking car. Like, I wanted, a, you know, I wanted a Prius. Like, no, like, that's not how it works, right? Well, and that's one of the, a couple things you said, I think one of the misconceptions, or at least we like kind of want to think that way to like make us not feel so guilty is like, oh, I bet at kill shelters, they only put down dogs that are like sick or that are not going to get adopted or whatever. And you're like, yeah, bone was fine. Yeah. It literally is because they couldn't afford him. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's the problem. Like it's not just because they're sick and it's not just because they're bad dogs or anything like that. It's just a lot of the times it comes down to money and, and just the length of time they stay in the shelter. They, Mm -hmm. if they don't get a lot of, a lot of the kill shelters have set like dates. It doesn't matter like, you know, what kind of dog it is or like how good it is. It, it's like every shelter is different, but it's like, if this dog's been here for six months and hasn't been adopted, it just gets put down. Like, I like, that's just like the rules some of them have. And, and it's like, it's super crazy, but like it, I would never blame the shelters. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it, I, I would never put the onus on the shelters because, you know, they're first of all, like completely overrun and running on shooting budgets. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like they can't, they can't just like, like hold dogs forever. Like I, I completely understand. It's like, it's has to like shelters are, are band-aids. Mm. To like a gun wound you know what i mean it's like yeah these people like shelters you know they're doing the best they can right they're at, like all these rescues and shelters they're just they're trying the best they can to manage the problem mm-hmm. but it's like putting a bandage over a shotgun wound in your stomach you know what i mean it's just like it it's not solving anything no and the problem's only getting worse we're just bleeding more right, right. so that's kind of like there's a, there's a larger problem here. So what are some of the laws or changes that have happened in Canada or in like different Providence? Cause I know in the U S it's like state by state has their own different thing and everything varies so much. Is there any kind of changes in the mix? I mean, it's, it's pretty similar here. Um, like a lot of it's like local, like municipality rules as well. Like in Winnipeg, you can't have pit bulls, but outside of Winnipeg, you can, um, in all of Ontario, you can't have pit bulls. Um, so it, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's kind of the same where it's like place by place is different. Um, but like for the most part, there really isn't any regulation around dogs at all. Um, except for pit bulls. <laughs> like that's pretty much like anybody can breed a dog. Like it, you don't need a license. You don't need to register. You, you don't have to do any of that. Um, you know, there's, there's not very much, uh, regulation in Canada, uh, pretty similar to the States I'd say, like, um, I know there's, there, there are a couple of States that are coming out with some, um, really good re- uh, regulations regarding backyard breeders and things like that. Yep. Um, which is, you know, which is amazing, amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, it's, there's so much of it happening that it's like, uh, like I said, it's just, it's not like, it's not really helping yet. So. Yeah. So was, I mean, obviously you've been a lover of shelter dogs since you were little, but where does the motivation come from? Or when did you kind of 
start thinking like, oh, I really want to like make this a thing I'm working on in my life because you started uh, Rush's Rescue Kitchen, right? Rescue Dog Kitchen. Rescue Dog Kitchen. Darn it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why. Yeah, I had to throw your last name in there because there was an R. No, uh, it's, it's the uh, the dog's Instagram. It's Rush's Rescue. Yeah. I, and I, I have too many accounts. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like I've seen that somewhere. Yeah, I didn't yeah, make yeah. that up. Okay. I feel no, better. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you're really becoming more and more and more outspoken about, you know, adopt, don't shop. So like, where does that come from? Like, is it just kind of like a passion that you've, you're like, this is, I care about this. I can't not talk about it. Yeah. It's, I mean, like, obviously like I've been adopting dogs since I was young. Right. And uh, it just, uh, it, it kind of all stemmed from just like these misconceptions that I hear all the time. And um, I mean, it's, it's just difficult to stand by and, and see the statistics and see, see, uh, what these dogs go through, like when you spend time with dogs, like and anybody, I always find it very interesting that when you ha- you know people that own dogs, and you know those people understand those dogs' personalities, how they can still sit there and I mean one not be vegan, but two <laughs> still buy from a breeder, knowing that there are dogs in shelters, and, mm. and like that's kind of where it stems from because I'm like. Like I've spent, I spent my entire, my entire basically life has been with shelter dogs. You know, I had Hunter first and now I have Bone and Bailey and I had Wolfie and like, there's nothing wrong with these dogs. Like there's, they're perfectly good dogs and they have humongous personalities. Mm -hmm. Um, Bailey is an absolute coward. Um, You know, something falls in the house and it could be in a completely different room and she's taken off. Like she's a coward. Like there's not like uh, anything out of the ordinary kind of thing, uh, you know, which is fine. Like mm-hmm. and Bone is like the complete opposite. He's a huge protector, like will defend anything. Um, but like you see their personalities and you see, you know, like sometimes like with Bailey, you can see that they, they sense fear. They sense emotions. Like these dogs yeah. have emotions and you can really see it. Um, when you spend time with them, like they're not just dogs. And like, you know, when, when people that don't own dogs are like, Oh, like they're just dogs. I'm like, okay, like you just haven't spent time with them. But like for people that have spent time with them, I'm like, man, you like, you understand that these dogs have personalities mm-hmm. that they're literally just like humans, except they can't, you know, speak English. Mm-hmm. And they have that personality. They have those emotions like you know, they do. So to think like in my mind, thinking that, um, you know, bone is sitting in that shelter, like shaking because he's so afraid or, or Bailey, you know, freaking out, like, you know, crying and whimpering in a corner, like to think that that happens still in a society where there are so many dog owners and there are so many people that understand dogs have emotions is like a super, uh, to me, like fucked up thing Mm -hmm. where I'm like, man, like these dogs can't speak, but they can, they can definitely show emotions. And I'm like, just trying to teach people that like, man, like, understand this like yeah it dogs yeah. feel emotions like you, you should be like when you know two million dogs in the states enter the enter you know shelters every single year two million two million yeah or it's two million animals sorry but that includes cots but it's like at 1.1 million that's a, like holy shit <laughs> over a million dogs enter the shelters every single year like man like that's super messed up like and a, and a lot of them have to get euthanized because it's it's impossible to keep up. You can't just keep – what are you going to do? Your whole city is just going to be a giant shelter? Like, you know what I mean? Like, so, yeah. like, there's, like, a larger problem here that I'm – that I, like, you know, when I see – when I think about Bone, you know, being euthanized or Bailey getting euthanized, I'm like, man, like, like that would destroy me. Like, that would yeah. absolutely destroy me thinking about – so – uh, to think that there's 2 million dogs or 2 million animals a year that enter the shelter system that don't even get a chance. Uh, you know, I, I think it's like, I have a platform. So I, I'm like, I should use this to do something. Yeah. And I think we, we've talked about this before, but that um, we just underestimate animals, right? Like we just underestimate their ability to connect. And like you said, like, they have emotions, they have personalities. They know, I think things before we know, you see all those videos of like animals, like when women are pregnant, that it just like, 
lay on the stomach of the woman because they are like something's happening in here yeah. like they're so smart they sense things they smell things we one of my parents shelter dogs he's um i've talked about this on the podcast before but he's um half pit bull half great dane right. and um he he can jump and and be a little bit uh overwhelming at times but when my grandma was staying with us she has alzheimer's mm-hmm. That dog would sit by her side and sit under her feet and just lay there and let her pet him, which was like the most heartwarming thing. And then also my mom and I were like, you little shit, you know exactly what you're doing because you jump on us, but you don't jump on her. What are you doing? Like, they know. They know. 100% they're smart. I mean, like, it's crazy. Like, Bone, Bone, I I give it to him all the time. I'm like, like, you're an idiot, but you're so smart. Like, like, (laughs) he... Like, cause I give him shit when he steals something he knows he's not supposed to have. Like he's not a dumb dog. He knows there's certain things he can have and certain things he can't. And when he steals something he's not supposed to have, and I'll be like sitting on the couch in the living room, he'll like walk by the living room, but like turn his head. So he like, he's like, oh, he can't see me if I turn my head. But I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, <laughs> I know you're doing something if your head's turned. And I'm like, like the fact that he like, in his mind, knew enough that he's not supposed to have this item and he's trying to hide it from me. Like, that's smart. Like, mm-hmm. it's a smart thing to do, but, like, the way he did it was just not the smartest. But I'm like, <laughs> man, like, these dogs are smart. These these, these creatures, they're not stupid. But, oh, like, no. You don't see it, right? Not at all. No, my favorite is watching my parents' dogs try and, like, bury a toy away from you, but they're, like, sitting next to you and putting it in a blanket, but they're, like, yeah. they'll never know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's my they favorite. They can't see it. They don't know. They... <laughs> It'll be under this blanket. They'll forget. But exactly. they still are trying to hide it from you, and, yeah. you know, they're so much smarter. I, oh, I've been torturing myself lately looking at rescue sites nonstop because I want a dog so bad. Yeah. yeah. So bad. So bad. This conversation is not helping. There you go. <laughs> um, I think the statistic you just said, I mean, I know this is just audio, so no one will be able to see my dumbfounded face. But when you said 2 million animals in the States enter shelters, like I, I knew it was high, but sometimes I just don't look at the numbers because it's sad, which is totally, I need to, I need to know the scope of the problem, but holy shit. Oh yeah. It's like, it's a problem. It's like, and like, so I don't know if you've seen the movie uh, Isle of Dogs. Mm-mm. Watch it. It's a, I'm pretty sure it's a Wes Anderson movie. So it's like super, um, it's super like, it's like different and very artsy. Mm-hmm. But the whole, the whole movie is about, so what happens in the movie is, is uh, uh, I think it's Japan gets overrun by dogs because of, uh, you know, overbreeding and overpopulation and, and they just, they can't handle the problem anymore because there's just too many dogs. And what happens is uh, a sickness breaks out within the dogs. It's kind of ironic that, you know, coronavirus. I was just going to say, cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. So a sickness breaks out. It's called like dog cough or something like that. So what they do is they ban all dogs. All dogs get exiled and they ship them off. Every single dog in the entire country gets shipped off to an island where um, it, it's a garbage. It's like where they go dump their trash. It's another kind of like, you know, trope on society, but I was just going to um, say, well, all of the metaphors here. Yeah, exactly. Right. But uh, so, so what happens in the movie is, you know, the whole movie is about how, uh, you know, one of a, a very elite person's dog gets shipped off by accident to the, to this Island. And this, uh, this kid, this elite kid uh, goes, goes back to save them. It goes to this garbage Island to save them. And then, comes back to society and tries to reintroduce dogs into society. And it's like, we are on par and we are on path to essentially reach that. Like Mm. we are, we are, we are breeding at such a rate, you know, in, in, uh, I think it was Norway or one of the Scandinavian countries, they just had a coronavirus outbreak in their mink farm and had to kill millions of minks. And, and it's like, man, like how, how as a society do we not understand that what we're doing right now, like you can't just keep breeding dogs and bringing them into society and then people abandoning them. Like society, like eventually the shelters will become overrun. 
And when the shelters are become overrun, people will just abandon them into forests or... Which already happens. Which already happens at an alarming rate, but it's just going to become more and more prevalent. And then all of a sudden, dogs are going to be everywhere. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and it's be- going to become a problem in, in, in places unless like legislation is introduced. Right. Okay. And like, that's like, that's ultimately what it all kind of circles around to it. And I know a lot of people are like very anti-government and anti, you know, control, but the fact of the matter is people are shitty. <laughs> like, people <laughs> are going to do whatever they can until they get like, and continue to get away with. Like that is at the end of the day, people are shitty and they, that's what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you cannot continue to expect people to do the good, the right thing. It just, it just will not happen. And, you know, until, you know, someone steps in and tells these breeders, like, right, yeah, you can't do this anymore until like all our shelters are cleared out. And it's actually interesting because if you look at a lot of European countries, mm-hmm. they've done this in Ger- Germany, like you're not allowed to buy from a breeder until one, you've proven that you've looked at every shelter and the shelters are empty and two, it, like you have to pass like courses to buy a dog in like European countries. You have to like buy, like, if you have a car, you have to buy special like mounts for the car and special seatbelts and all this other crazy stuff. It's like, it is a very Damn. intensive process in European countries. It makes you have to be a like dog. a responsible pet owner. <laughs> well, basically. Exactly, right. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. And it's just like, this is what we need. <laughs> like, yeah. they, like they are not having a dog problem in Germany or, you know, these other countries, like, in these European com- countries, like they actually, a lot of those countries ship in dogs from other countries that are having overpopulation problems, like sh- sh- shipping in shelter dogs because they've done such a good job managing the dog population that there's no shelter dogs. Wow. And like, and, and like that's where like we need to progress to as a society or it's, we're just going to end up like I love dog where all dogs are going to be banned. And like, that's, you know, that's like the other side. It's just like, Hey, like if, if you guys can't get your shit together, yeah, this is what's like, this is like, this is where we're headed because right. like, you know, like I said, it's, it, it's all like these numbers are decreasing, you know, 2 million animals a year enter the shelters. The shit's not decreasing. The more people we get, the like the more people that live in North America, the more people that are born, the, the more of these numbers are going up. Right. So like we, we got to do something. This podcast is supported by Will's Vegan Store. Will's Vegan Store has been a vegan company at the front of vegan clothing and sustainable fashion since they launched in 2013 by their founder, Will Green. They produce the most beautiful, vegan, sustainably made shoes, clothing, and accessories. I have been obsessed with this brand for years now. They were one of the first vegan brands that I really made the switch to. It can be hard to thrift shoes, but I love knowing that if I'm going to purchase a pair of shoes from Will's Vegan Store, they are going to be ethically made, their workers are protected, they don't use plastic packaging, they're delivered in an environmentally friendly way. It's truly the most amazing company to support. So if you're ready to try them yourself, hit the link in the show notes so they know that I sent you. This podcast is supported by Parade Underwear. Parade believes that the materials that touch your skin should be as comfortable as possible wherever life takes you. That's why their styles come in a large range of fabrics from seamless universal that disappears under clothes to cozy waffles plush comfort that keep you comfy on every occasion. Parade understands that everyone deserves to express themselves however they choose because we're all unique. And Parade knows that there's no parade without our planet. They strive to make all of their products from reclaimed, recycled, responsible, renewable, or regenerative materials. This is really a win-win-win. I love Parade. I've been wearing them for a while now, and I can't recommend them enough. And of course, we love the mission. Use code consciously.carly for 20% off your first order. That's C-O-N-S-C-I-O-U-S-L-Y. Dot C-A-R-L-Y, consciously.carly. Enjoy your new undies. 
Well, and I think a lot of people fall back on the like, but I wanted this dog or I wanted this specific thing. Or I've heard people being like, I was waiting for the right color dog. I'm just like, I can't with you. I like, I actually can't have a conversation with you. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but uh. you can find any type of dog in rescue. There are not only dogs specific for breeds like pit bull rescues and Great Dane rescues and whatever, but also just like there's every type of dog in a rescue. Like literally, like, and especially with that, with that website, I was saying petfinder.com, mm. you can, you can filter by breed. You can filter by age. You can filter by weight. You can filter by like location. You, you literally filter by anything. So like, wow. like all of those excuses go out the window. Like if you want a puppy filter by puppies and I'll show you all the puppies and shelters. Mm. It's like, it's not like you can't get puppies and shelters. Like it's, it's, it's the, in, it. The problem is, is it's the Instagram effect. Everyone wants the Instagrammable dog, right? Everyone that wants just made them, my like, stomach like, hurt. Well, it's the truth, right? I it's, know. It's, it's everyone wants that Instagrammable dog, and it's kind of hilarious that I have obviously a very Instagrammable dog. Well, two. I was well, just gonna say, don't dogs. leave Bailey yeah, out of this. No, yeah, both of them are very good looking, right? Like, <laughs> But the thing is, I got both of them in shelters still. So it's not like you can't get an Instagrammable dog in shelters. And that is far from the reason I got them. I got them <laughs> because they were, they were huge and I wanted big dogs. Yeah. Um, but like to all those people that, you know, want the Instagrammable dog, want the picture perfect dog, it's like, you can still do that. You can still like, you know, uh, if 2 million animals are entering the shelters every year, like you don't think you can... You, you don't think you'd be able to get one mm-hmm. out of 2 million animals. You don't think one's going to be right. <laughs> for you. Like, come on. Like uh, people are just lazy. You know what I mean? People are just, and people are lazy and shitty and like, they just don't want to. And it sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to think about that, you know, people won't do the right thing, mm-hmm. but like they won't. So yes. You know, so you're need, fully in support of like legislation needs oh yeah. to oh yeah help this uh, problem because you're like without it I'm just kind of trying I'm just if, correct me if I'm wrong but your your point of view is like without it here's our problem yeah no 100 percent and like like I said like you you can see you can you can already see the problem right and like what's happening um and you can just see like it's like the capitalistic society we live in is people are going to do it. If you can make money doing it, people are going to do it. Mm. Right? And, and puppy mills, you can make a lot of money because people are stupid and they'll pay a lot of money. So like, there's only so much education you can do as a person. Like I can educate, you know, all I have 17,000 followers. I can educate all 17,000 followers I have, but you know, in Canada, there's 32 million other people. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? There's, there's always so much education you can do right? before, uh, before like you, there, there needs to be something else. And like, it's not like, it's not like shelters are something that's new. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like, it's not like rescues are like a new thing that like have just popped up in the past 10 years. So like people are still learning about them, you know, all that stuff. It's like, no, shelters have been around like dog, like the pound, the pound yeah. is like, you know, you see, you see. Like you see that in movies that are based in like the 1800s, you know what I mean? Like the the pound, which is a shelter, have been around for hundreds of years. Yeah, people know about this. They're in they're in books. They're in movies. They're in like they made an entire movie called Lady and the Tramp about you know <laughs> about it. Like it's a whole Disney movie. It's it's like there's always so much education you can do about shelter dogs before you're like, okay, this isn't fucking working. We need to do something else. Like, and it's like it's like all this, it's all like, it's, it kind of goes back to the same stuff with the coronavirus. It's like, all right, we need to do something like this, what we're doing right now isn't working. We need to do something else. And, and, you know, like it's, it, we, we could go on forever about it, but like, yeah, like we need legislation. Like people have shown for the past literally hundreds of years right. that they're shitty. And this problem is slowly getting out of control. Mm-hmm. And at, at, at a certain point we'll be at, a point where like, where we will not, we won't be able to control it without actively hunting dogs because they're going to run overrun our population. And it's like a super fucked up thing to think about. But if you look at, if you look at other places, like, you know, 
if you look at places like Montana and Idaho and, and, and these places that have a lot of national parks, when they have overpopulation problems, they put bounty outs on those overpopulated problems and they get paid to kill those animals. At a certain point, right. the way we're progressing, if people keep abandoning them, dogs in forests and you know, in, in national parks and just like out in the streets, like it, it happens all the time, these dogs are going to start having to be hunted because they're going to be wild dogs. Mm-hmm. And they're going to be aggressive. Mm-hmm. If, if like with Wolfie, we're lucky we got him at a young age. We were able to yeah. domesticate him still. But in, in Manitoba, it's it's a very serious problem in northern Manitoba where people abandon uh, dogs into the wilderness. And oh they, really? They, oh, they roam around in packs and they kill people because they're they're wild animals. Right. You know what I mean? They, and we will progress to that as a society if something isn't done. Like, yes, like I, I am full, like I am full in for like legislation and, and there needs to be some control over if, if you're going to still allow breeders, there needs to be some control over, you can't just let everyone breed dogs. It's, it's just, it's one insanely unethical and two, it's leading to a, a, a more widespread issue. Do you see any ethical way for breeding to exist? In the current state of our society, absolutely not. I, if let's say, I know a lot of people will take uh, offense to this be, with service dogs and dogs with, you know, they mm. need dogs that have jobs and things like that. But, you know, with our RCMP uh, in Canada, they, they mandated that they're going to take a certain amount of uh, rescue dogs to train as, uh, as police dogs, you know, every year. Oh, wow. And it's just like, like, so like, I, like, I get it. Like I get there are like certain jobs mm-hmm. and certain careers and certain people, like there, there are certain illnesses and, and certain people that need service dogs and need, you know, canine dogs and, and police dogs and things like that. But like, it's shown that you can still get those dogs from shelters. You know what I mean? It, it like, you can still train those dogs. Like, you yeah, can, that's the pushback. A lot I hear is service animals. They're like, what about service yeah. animals? For sure. And, and like, Oh, like, okay. Like even, even if we took that out of it, even if we're like, okay, you know what? If you're breeding a dog to be a service animal, good. Continue. You got it. No problem. What percentage of people <laughs> are, are getting dogs for you know a service animal? Yeah, it is. It is a very slim percent. It is not you know the overwhelming majority. It's not right. I would you know I don't know the exact statistic, but I would take a gander that it's less than one percent of people that are buying dogs are getting them for service animals. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So like, okay, like sure, let let people breed dogs to continue to you know have those service animals. Sure, great, whatever. That's not addressing the issue. <laughs> like, yeah, totally. That's, like that's like it, it's like we're not dealing with the ninety nine point five percent of people that are buying dogs not to be service animals. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, so in in today's society, as it stands, with two million dogs or two million animals entering shelters every single year, no, there 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 just isn't an ethical way in North America to buy from a breeder. Mm-hmm. It's, like, like I said, unless you need a very specific dog for a very specific reason, um, and you've tried to look at in shelters, it's not ethical. If you're getting a family dog, no, it, it's, in, it's impossible to know that these dogs, these perfectly fine dogs are sitting in shelters suffering and going and asking someone to bring another dog into society for your own, for your own need even though there is, there's perfectly good dogs that could meet your need um, in shelters. It's completely unethical. I remember hearing where I was, where I went to grad school, I would go to the shelter there because um, someone I knew would foster animals. So I would go with them Mm -hmm. to pick them up and stuff. And she was telling us about how, you know, like Easter was coming and they'll probably have a lot of bunnies soon. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, Easter comes and these parents buy bunnies for their kids. And then they realize that they don't really want a bunny. And we get a bunch of bunnies around Easter. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Come on. 
Yeah, it's crazy. It's a, it's the same with uh, it's at Christmas too with puppies. Ah. Plenty of people do it with they'll they'll buy puppies at Christmas, have them for like a week, and then be like, oh, this is too much work, and then abandon. So in January, the uh, the shelters get flooded with puppies. Well, crazy. this episode you know coming out the first week of december hopefully a few people are like oh adopt for yeah. the holidays <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go to a yeah. shelter and help them out It'd be how nice. how are shelters funded in canada is it all private uh for it, it, it depends we do have some that are uh so like in winnipeg we have the winnipeg humane uh no, sorry. We have the Winnipeg Animals uh, Services. Mm-hmm. That would be like that would be like your typical pound. Right. Um, it is city funded. So uh, like some similar to the states kind of mix of everything. Yeah, yeah. So like yeah. So so, so we have like the Animal Services, um, but then we have like the Humane Society. That's I think they do get a little bit of provincial funding. Okay. Um, but for the most part, it's like largely like donors and stuff like that. And then and then we have you know. Um, you know, a bunch of smaller shelters that are completely like, um, run on like fundraised money and, uh, uh, have no provincial or federal funding kind of thing. Man, that's a lot. Like that's a, it's, it's a lot of money to keep a shelter going. Oh, it, it, it's, it's insane. It's a, it's an insane amount of work and it's the same amount of you know stress and like people don't be, I don't think a lot of people realize because a lot of these a lot of the times these animals come in with a lot of medical conditions mm. that the shelter is responsible for paying for. So a lot of the times like the vets will give shelters discounts and things like that because they're trying to help them out. But at, you know, at the same time, like still expensive, like there's a couple of shelters I work with that are like, that have like eight to $15,000 in vet bills that they're like, man, like, we can't take any more dogs on until we get these vet bills covered. Oh. Because the vets are like, obviously like, Hey, like we need you to pay because we need to pay our own bills. Right. Yeah. So, so it's like, it's, it's crazy how much money and, and time goes into these things that like so many people like just don't realize. Well, and even if, you know, I mean, I don't personally understand it, but when people are like, I'm not an animal person like that, I feel like that's a red flag, but all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> sure. like, okay. Um, but when people say that, like, even if you don't connect to the emotional part of this, financially like you said bone could have been like five six thousand dollars and obviously you have to pay the shelter and costs of whatever but i'm guessing you didn't pay five thousand dollars for bone no no i paid i i got him from a smaller shelter um so it cost me a little bit more than most uh most of the time so like if i was to get bailey or bone from the humane society here it's like 350 bucks right uh, and they come they come neutered or spayed fully vaccinated like full checkup and i think they come with like a couple months worth of like pet insurance if you buy from a breeder you'll pay like five thousand dollars they won't come neutered or spayed they won't come vaccinated they won't come with pet insurance it makes literally zero financial sense it is so dumb like it is (laughs) the stupidest thing you can do like i i paid i ended up paying uh 700 for bone Mm -hmm. because uh um, he was, he was a bigger dog and he was at a smaller shelter. So like, I had, I had no problem paying 700. Yeah, totally. You know what I mean? Like they were smaller, they, it, they neutered him, they vaccinated him, they dewormed him. Yeah. Perfect. We're good. Uh, like I covered their costs and, and, and food basically. So yeah, I'm, I'm fine with doing that, but yeah, like it, it is, it's ridiculous to think about even just from a financial standpoint, like, you know, take the dogs out. It makes no sense. Like you can get a perfectly good dog with everything for like three to five hundred dollars it's like ten percent of the cost like yeah it's wildly different yeah it, it, it makes no sense it makes absolutely no sense so do you plan to open your own rescue someday <laughs> um, <laughs> i don't know uh it it's something i've thought about uh, um you know a bunch and it's it's an interesting question uh, the problem, the problem with rescues and like animal sanctuaries and things like that is like, we've been talking about is they're, they're, they all rely on, you know, fundraised money, right. They all rely, they're all shoestring budgets and yep. 
And, you know, I want to, I want to help dogs. I want to help animals and do all that. But I also don't want to, for the rest of my life, be begging people for money. Yeah. That's not like, that's not something I, w- I think I would get enjoyment out of. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to figure out a way to create an animal sanctuary or an animal kind of rescue business somehow um, that would kind of be self-sustaining. Like, mm-hmm. I don't need it to be profitable. I just need it to pay the bills itself. And, you know, if we have to fundraise here and there, sure, whatever, I don't right. care. But I don't want to be like every month setting up a GoFundMe because, you know, bone broke a leg or I got a new cow in that, you know, has all this shit going on. It's just like, I want, if I'm going to do this, I want it to be self-sustaining that we, that like, this can make sense that like, it's, it's sustainable. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, if you're just constantly like looking for, you know, fundraisers and, and money and donations and all that, like, you'll, you'll burn out. Like, yeah, you'll totally. Burn out and then you're no good to anybody. You're not helping animals you're not helping yourself like you know what i mean you're, you're you're useless if you burn out so uh so i i'm trying to figure out how to um kind of sustainably do that uh it's it wouldn't be for a couple of years anyway there's a there's a lot of other things that i, w- I would want to do first before i did something like that um but it, it's a th- it's a thought that it's been thrown around in my mind a lot it just it it needs to be like fleshed out a lot more. Well, keep me in the loop. Cause yeah. I say all the time, like someday I'm just going to have this big sanctuary and animals are going to roam and yeah. they're going to be saved. So I'm, I'm in, I want to help. Go. All right. Well, we'll figure it out. One of these days we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll put our minds together and, and see what we can come up with. We'll drive around in our bus caravan. There you go. <laughs> Saving all the animals. Saving all the animals. That actually sounds pretty ideal. Yeah, very <laughs> ideal, actually. <laughs> yeah, there's just, it's hard to have this conversation with some people, I think, about like shelter pets and breeders because people get really defensive. And yeah. have you have you had conversations that like get really, I don't know, heated or uncomfortable with people that like don't understand? Not really. Uh, you know, that's one of the um, benefits of being a six foot, 230 pound male <laughs> um, in today's society is uh, generally speaking, most people don't argue with me, especially not in person. Uh, you know, they might say things behind my back, but it's not something I you know, care about. So, uh, but yeah, no, for, for the most part, I don't, no one's really ever said anything to me and, and not even surprisingly online. I've had a couple of Twitter, you know, warriors call me out and try, try to call me out for uh, uh, things before, but never for the dog thing. Um, Interesting. I, I mean, I, I think, it, I think it's difficult to, you know, to argue the facts. Like, yeah. I just, yeah. I just present the facts and be like, argue this, you know, 2 million animals enter the shelter every year. You going to a breeder is a shitty decision. Mm -hmm. argue that like you can't like it's 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 a you it's like okay like i want a specific breed i'm like boom here's pet finder go sort by (laughs) breed boom you know what i mean (laughs) yeah oh oh uh you know the shelter rejected my application it's just like then you probably shouldn't own a dog (laughs) if a shelter rejected your application it's because you're probably shitty right like it's like (laughs) you know what i mean it's like you know obviously shelters uh sometimes get hundreds of applications for a dog right they have to filter them somehow, but like, yeah. but it's like, man, like if the shelter rejected your application because like your living situation isn't great, <laughs> Ooh. don't, like, don't get a dog. Like, maybe you should hold off. Exactly. It's like, maybe like they're telling you something like don't get a dog. Like, but you know, but like, yeah. So like for the most part, like no, no one's really argued with me. And I know, I know, especially with women, they have very uh, different lived experiences. Um, even like when I, I was, I lived, I grew up in Niagara and uh, me, and me and my brother were bartenders there for a while. And, and my mom was a waitress and my sister was a waitress there. And me and my brother's lived experiences as bartenders in Niagara Falls uh, was significantly different than my uh, mom's and sister's. Like me and my brother never dealt with anything uh negative like people were and like and we were we worked at a restaurant where the food was gross too so <laughs> and we knew the food was gross 
So like, you know, we go up to a table, like, how's the food? They're like, oh, it's delicious. You know what I mean? And we're like, oh, like, whatever. Like, we know you're talking shit, but I don't care. Like, it's funny, tip, whatever. But like, you know, like my mom's and sister's experience, like, like people would spit the food into their hand and be like, here, you try this. And, and, and I've been something. a server like, and a bartender. Yeah, there you go. Like, so you understand, right? Like, so, you know what I mean? Like, so have people like confronted me about my views on, on dogs? Like, no, <laughs> like, no, they just, people generally don't confront me on, on much. Yeah. Um, but like, especially not on the dog thing. And I think it's just probably because it's just very, it, it's very hard to argue when, you know, I can just present all these facts. It's like, yeah, you're arguing nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. Which I think is cool because you recognize you're like, okay, I have privilege in this sense. Like I get to speak about these things. Like I'm going to use it. Yeah. Well, I mean like, that's it. Right. It's just like, I could just post pictures of me playing football, like every other athlete, but <laughs> you know, like football, like football is cool, man. But like, <laughs> whatever like football is going to end one day so like like then what right right and you're no, I re- the guy that posts old pictures of you playing football <laughs> like like the glory years yeah exactly you're fucking like you're like what's that guy's name on napoleon dynamite the uncle oh um you know what i'm shit. talking about yeah, right? yeah i do yeah, yeah. yeah i do so like, right like you're, you're just like that that guy sitting on the porch talking about fucking high school football <laughs> when like, you peaked yeah exactly like <laughs> Sick, right so like at least like at least if I can I'm gonna try and do something with it now right yeah I think that it's so important and people really underestimate this is gonna get like really corny but I, I fully believe it so I'm gonna say it anyway but like people underestimate the reach they can have you know like I am not a six two whatever <laughs> however yeah. much you weigh man but you know like I'm 5'2 and 120 pounds soaking wet so like my impact is a little different but I still can reach people in a different way you know exactly, like yeah. and even if one person reaches out to me and was like whoa the yoga class you taught tonight made me really like slow down and think about life like that awareness they're going to share with someone else or that awareness is going to help them and like the ripple effect could be that maybe three or four people this week think about the world a little differently. You know, like we just underestimate our reach. A hundred percent. I think, I think sometimes, especially on social media, it's crazy to, to see, you know, I have, I have the analytics set up on my account and like on Twitter, I have like 10,000 followers, like nothing crazy. Like mm-hmm. you know, 10,000 10, is like a lot of people, but like, it's not like, and they, you know, when, when you have people with like hundreds of thousands and millions of followers, like 10,000 is a very, you know, it's a small amount. Mm-hmm. But like, when I look at my analytics every month, over 2 million people see my thing, like see my post. you know what I mean? So, so when you think about that impact that, you know, that, that post had that, like I posted a picture of bone and Bailey playing, you know what I mean? Like, you think about that's like, for me, that's just my everyday lived life and taking 10 seconds to post about it on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. But like, it is, it can be seen and viewed by literally millions of people. And, and we all have that impact. And, and if you think about, you know, the coronavirus and how it spreads, it's like, the problem with it is, is it's not that, you know, us young people are going to get it and die from it. It's that, we're going to get it, spread it to one person. That one person is going to spread it to five people. Those five people are going to spread it to a hundred yep. people. Right. And it's like, and it's that it's the same thing. You know what I mean? It's, it's the same thing when you're talking about all these other things, it's like, you have that ability to spread that to five people. Then those five people spread it out to a hundred people. Right. It's, but like so many people, so many people get caught up in only spreading it to the five people at the mm. start that they don't see that their message was then shared to a hundred other people and then to 10,000 other people from there. Right. They they just see that it was only shared to those five people. Right. Or only got this many likes or or whatever it is. Exactly. Right. So, and they, they, they see that and they get caught up in that. And then that's where like a lot of, uh, you know, people like kind of like fizzle out and they, 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 they think they're not like good enough. And it's just like, man, like you have a lot more impact. Uh, than you think even if you're even if you're talking to your family about it like yeah I I turned both my parents vegan I told Mm -hmm. them like I'm like hey like if you guys like don't figure it out like 
Like, I, I just like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, if you guys die because of the way you eat, like, I'm going to be very upset. And, um, like they went vegan because of it. You know what I mean? And, and people like underestimate how much uh, influence they have just because they don't have a hundred thousand followers Yeah, and get like 10,000 likes on a picture. It doesn't mean you don't haven't actually influenced somebody. You know what I mean? And, and I think it speaks a lot more when you like, you speak your own truth, even if it only is to a hundred or 200 people. Right. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's very underestimated in today's society. Totally. And then you can tell when people, or at least I can on social media, lose that authenticity because they're trying for the 3 million people versus speaking to the ones that are listening. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't have, you know, let's say as many Instagram followers as you, but if I like gave up on that, what about the few people that have gone vegan because of what I posted? And like, ask me for, I get random, you know, DMs about like, okay, I'm kind of interested because of what you posted, but like, I don't know where to start. And I'm like, yay, like here's 14 million, you know, like I share yeah, yeah. this like whole thing. I'm like so excited and probably very overwhelming, but I'm just like, <laughs> I'm so excited. Like yeah. you lose sight of the people you could help by trying to reach all these people that you like don't have contact with yet. Exactly. You know, yeah, no, exactly. And, and you know, it, I think people need to kind of focus on, on you know, what's right in front of them instead of what's the potential of, of what's out there. Right. Mm-hmm. Totally. That was like, that was deep, man. <laughs> we really, good. we really got into it. Yeah. No, it's good. Is there anything else you want to share about shelters or dog love or any advice for anyone? Uh, I think the biggest advice for me when people are looking for dogs is like, be patient. Like it took Mm. me, it took me literally eight months to adopt bone. Um, And then it took me another, I ended up, when did I get Bailey? I, I got Bailey like a year and a half after I got bone. Uh, and I fostered a dog in between. Um, and I'm looking for a third dog now. I've been looking for about six months and still haven't found one. Oh, you are looking for a third dog. Oh yeah. I'm always looking for dogs. <laughs> um, Your face. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, it, it, and a lot of people get discouraged. Like I said, like they get declined from a shelter or something like that. And, and you know, you can get declined for a shelter for you know, a million different reasons. Uh, but it, like a lot of the times they just get overwhelmed with applications. Right. So uh, just like, just be patient. Uh, like you'll find a dog that's meant to be, uh, in your life, uh, at the right time. It, you, you can't rush the process here. Like it's, it's not, and it's not a process process you want to rush. It's, right. it's, uh, you know, adopting a dog, it's, it's a big deal. It's a big, uh, it's a big life step, especially if it's your first dog. Um, and it's something that's not to be taken lightly. So like, yeah, if it takes six months, it takes six months. If it takes a year, it takes a year. Um, but it's definitely not something to be rushed. And, you know, I I always find it funny because a lot of people will get upset with the shelter system taking so long and they'll go, go on a waiting list for a breeder. But then I'm like, okay, so you're going to wait two years on the wait list for a breeder. Like, yes. Just why don't, why don't you just like, during those two years, just keep looking for an adoptable, like, you know what I mean? So it's just like, just like be patient. Like the shelters are doing the best they can with the resources they have. And mm. uh, like, they're trying their best, but like, yeah, like it, it, if, if it's meant to be like, it's, it, it'll, it'll come your way kind of thing. Like you just like, you don't want to rush into uh, adopting a dog, the wrong dog for you. If you're lazy, don't get a Husky. Like, you know what I mean? If you're active, <laughs> don't get a don't get a great peer. Like it, 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 it's, um, you know, if you're, if you want, if you travel a lot, you know what I mean? Like you got to get the right kind of dog that's going to be uh, okay with that. So uh, like do your research, be patient. Um, and just kind of like, like just, yeah, just be patient. the biggest one. That's really good advice. That always blew my mind too, where people are like, well, it takes so long. I'm on the list for a breeder for a bred dog. And I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, people, people are stupid. Oh, and I was going to say, too, if anyone's doing any holiday shopping, you have some fun <laughs> if you want to put in a shameless plug. Yeah, there you go. I, I uh, Very shameless plug. I did just launch our uh, Rescue Dog Kitchen merch store. 
Um, we have an entire merch tour. I know this is, they won't be able to see it, but I'm actually wearing the sweater right now. Um, yes. It says dog hair is my new aesthetic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we, we just launched our merch store. Uh, we sell, we sell mugs, we sell stickers, we sell sweaters, we sell uh, tote bags and the Christmas cards right now. Um, and a lot of, you know, we're, we're kind of expanding it to a lot of other things. And, and the whole point of it is to raise funds for dog shelters. So uh, 50% of the profits are getting donated back to, to dog shelters kind of everywhere. Um, we, our first, we, we just launched it this week and we've already done, uh, I think almost 4,000 in sales. So, oh my gosh, John. Yeah. We're, we're, so we're, we're, we're super happy with how it was, uh, everyone kind of like perceived it and came um, and have, has liked it so far. So we're definitely going to be expanding it to include a lot more. Uh, in the future, we want to do uh, like aprons next. Aprons and toques are going to be the next thing on the list. Yes, uh, I need an yeah. apron. Yeah. Yes. We're actually, we're sitting on 600 face masks right now as well that we're trying to get printed. Okay. So we'll have a uh, face mask coming out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's like everything's like dog related, um, but everything's also eco-friendly. So our, our tote bags are made from recycled cotton. Um, our sweaters are made from organic cotton, which uses significantly less than um, regular cotton. Mm-hmm. And uh, everything, is, everything was sourced within North America. So, so the sweaters were sourced from uh, a company in the States. Uh, the, the mugs were from a company in Canada. The tote bags were from a company in Canada. The, the designers I used to help me design the products uh, were local designers in Winnipeg um, and things like that. So I tried to do everything as uh, you know, eco-friendly and you know, responsible as possible. I didn't. Yeah, just, just really be, thoughtful. Yeah, like I didn't want to just be like another fast fashion company, right? Like, right. Like yeah, like I definitely could have gotten these sweaters for significantly cheaper. Like I was looking at places, they're like, oh yeah, like you can get get them for like two to five bucks a sweater, where I paid twenty nine bucks a sweater. Right. Um. You know what I mean? And yeah. Obviously, my profit margins would have been way bigger, and I would have been able to raise a lot more money for dogs. But I'm like at the same time, like. It, fast fashion and the you know destruction of the environment is only you know uh, it's only it's it's, like a, it's a catalyst to like hurting other animals so like yeah what's the point of doing that yeah like that, it doesn't make sense like yeah you're raising money for one animal but like you're destroying another animal's environment so like right why, why would i do that you know yeah what I mean? so, so everything you know we tried our best to make everything eco-friendly and responsible and you know all all of our packaging is recyclable right now uh and things like that so uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting. We were like, we're, I think we're at like 50% sold out in our first week. So we're going to have, that's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, we're super happy with how, uh, how it started. It's, you know, it's a one main operation. So I do, (laughs) I do everything. I I pack, I ship, I, I, I get everything out myself and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot, but you know, it's for the dog. So I'm super, you know, I'm super happy about it. I can put the link in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, sure. people can check that out. Cause I, hopefully my mom doesn't listen to this episode before Christmas, but she probably needs one of those tote bags and or yeah, sweatshirts. There you, yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. It's really fun. I'm excited for aprons. I keep, I, uh, every time I cook, I'm like, I'm not going to wear an apron. That's too domestic, but I keep like fucking up my sweaters and stuff. Yeah, so exactly, yeah. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to need to jump on that when you release those. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let you know. Don't worry. Sounds great. Well, um, thank you again for joining me. I love talking to you. And this was a really fun episode that I wanted to do um, before the holidays and in honor of all the shelter pets that need love. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on. It's always, uh, it's always a good time. I always enjoy uh, being able to kind of spread the message and, and help dogs out when I can, right? Yeah, well, you're doing a great job. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another episode of Consciously Clueless. If you're enjoying this podcast, please subscribe, share with your friends, put it on social media. Don't forget to tag me. If you're on Apple Podcasts or Good Pods, leave a review. Reviews and shares help more people to see the podcast and join in on the fun. If you want to make sure to stay up to date on future episodes, follow me at Consciously Carly on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or Pinterest, and head to consciouslycarly.com to sign up for the newsletter. Ready for more Conscious Living content? Check out patreon.com slash consciouslycarly and join the exclusive community over there. And finally, if you're ready to take better care of yourself and the world, let's work together. Click the link in the show notes to head to the website, find out more, and schedule a free discovery call with me. Chat soon. In 2016, Mint Mobile was born... 
because its founders thought that Big Wireless was, well, dumb. So they decided it was time to create a smarter wireless company, one that extends its middle finger to conventional truths while also pointing out where Big Wireless is letting people down. They're online only. You can buy plans that are three month, six month, 12 month, no contracts, choose to stay as long as you want. There are no overages. There's no surprises. There's just no BS. And for someone who lives in a remote area like myself, I can attest to the fact that the service is great and I have truly had no problems and oftentimes is better than the big wireless companies I was with before. To find out more about how Mint Mobile can work for you, hit the link in the show notes so they know that I sent you. (laughs) 